Talk to me. Talk to me. Hello and welcome. I'm Dan Gersten, host of Chatting with History, where you can listen in to conversations I have with some of the most famous characters in the history of Western civilization. And today's guest is no exception. It's Benjamin Franklin. Now, earlier in our series, Chatting with History had the pleasure of speaking with Leonardo da Vinci, proclaimed by many as the first Renaissance man. Well, and having Benjamin Franklin on today, we can now add having America's first Renaissance man to our Chatting with History guest list. Noted author, printer, political theorist, politician, postmaster, scientist, musician, inventor, satirist, civic activist, statesman, and diplomat, he was one of the United States founding fathers and earned the title of the first American for his early and tireless campaigning for colonial unity. And he is credited with being the most influential of the founding fathers in inventing the type of society America would become. So without further delay, let's meet Benjamin Franklin. Ambassador Franklin, welcome to the show. Why, thank you, Dan. And please call me Ben. Many of my friends called me Ben. Okay, Ben it is. You know, but when George Washington was our guest, he referred to you as Benny. <laughs> well, I've been carousing with George for years, and honestly, I've just met you. Are you a party animal? Well, some think I am. You know, but probably nothing compared to how some stories portray you. <laughs> Anyhow, as is customary on Chatting with History, when we first meet our guest, why don't you start telling us about your childhood? Sure thing. I was born on January 17, 1706, in Boston to Josiah Franklin and Abia Folger, father's second wife. A dad was an English-born businessman who emigrated to the American colonies, settling in Boston in 1682, where he took up the trade of tallow chandler and soap boiler. Uh, he married my mother after his first wife died, giving birth to their seventh child. I was the eighth of ten children born to my parents, so all told, father had 17 children. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of kids. <laughs> well, yes, it is. But remember, that's long before advances in birth control, and there, well, there weren't as many diversions as there are today, what with televisions, movies, and video games, and, well, don't forget the heating. Heating? Well, yes, heating. Those New England winter nights got pretty cold and, well, you know what they say about body heat. Okay. So, back to your story. Well, I was baptized at the Old South Meeting House in Boston where my father served as a, a tithing man, a prominent and highly respected member of the Third Church of Boston Congregation of the United Church of Christ. And, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, that meeting house figured prominently during the years leading up to the Revolutionary War. Yes, it did. The congregation had a number of notable figures, including Samuel Adams, uh, William Dawes, active in the Boston militia, and the one who rode out to Lexington, Massachusetts to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams that the British were coming. Now, others included Samuel Sewell, who represented Massachusetts in Congress from 1796 to 1800, and as Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, and Phyllis Wheatley, the second published African-American poet and first published African-American woman in America. And then there was the Tea Party. Yes, the Tea Party, and not to be confused with some political movement of today that bears little, if any, resemblance to the events in Boston in 1773 when Samuel Adams gave signals from the Old South Meeting House for the war whoops that started the real Boston Tea Party. And Old South, as it's more commonly known, helped form the City Mission Society of Boston in 1816 to serve that city's urban poor. And during the Civil War, it became a recruiting center for the Union Army. Today, the congregation has formally adopted a platform of equality, social justice, and peace, exhibiting increased diversity by race, class, and sexual orientation. Loved it back then, love it still. And we're told 
that your father had you attend Boston Latin School, hoping that you'd eventually become a member of the clergy. Yes, so well, that's what he had hoped, but being a candle and soap maker, and with many mouths to feed, father only had enough money to send me to that school for only two years, though far more years of schooling were necessary to become a clergyman. So when my formal school ended when I was 10, it, it put any thoughts of my becoming a clergyman to rest. I understand that for a time you worked with your father. Yes, I, I did that until I was 12, and oh boy, was that boring. I dipped the wax, cut the wicks, dipped the wax, cut the wicks of father, perhaps fearing I'd run off to sea, apprenticed me to my older brother James, who was a printer, and let me tell you what a difference that was from dipping wax and cutting wicks. So, what did you do for your brother James? Well, I helped, helped him uh, compose pamphlets and set type, and I'd sell his products on the street. When I was uh, 15, James founded the New England Courant, which was the first truly independent newspaper founded in the colonies. And unlike the other two papers in Boston, it carried articles, opinion written by James' friends, advertisements, and news of ship schedules, and, and not just reprinted news from abroad. And did you also get to write for the new newspaper? Well, kind of. Uh, I wanted to write for the paper, but James didn't go for it. Uh, so I pretended to be a middle-aged widow named Silence Duguid, writing 14 letters that the paper published, letters which gained some relatively recent popularity thanks to the first National Treasure movie starring Nicolas Cage. Well, anyway, uh, the letters were filled with advice and, and, and very critical of the world around her, uh, particularly concerning the issue of how women were treated. So, even as a lad of 16, you were pro-women's rights. Oh, I guess so. Well, after all, I certainly advocated that women were highly capable of intellectual endeavors, uh, contrary to what many males believed at the time, namely that it was improper to educate women and that they were naturally unequal to men in that regard. Well, I mean, here it is. Years after the Silence Do Good Letters were published in 1722, and millions of males in the country that you helped found still have the attitude that women are subservient to men and that they belong in the kitchen, breeding, raising kids, and otherwise servicing the males in their lives. Well, in some areas, society has made tremendous amount of progress, in others, well, not so much. So, back to the Silence Do Good Letters. I mean, eventually, your brother discovered that you were the one writing them. I mean, how did that work out? Oh, not too well. <laughs> I would sneak the letters under the print shop door at night so no one knew it was I writing the pieces. Eventually, though, I confessed, and, and while James's friends thought me precocious and funny, James was angry and, well, perhaps maybe a little jealous of the attention paid to me. And did this disagreement cause you to leave the apprenticeship with James? I mean, we're told that you took off in 1723, even though running away was illegal at the time. Well, partially. Uh, there was another incident which resulted in James being jailed and with me having to keep the paper running for several issues. What was that about? Well, smallpox was a deadly disease in those days, and the Mathers, a powerful family of Puritan preachers, supported inoculation, which James and I believed only made people sicker, a view with which most Bostonians agreed. Still, that didn't sit well with the Mathers, and James was thrown in jail. Interesting. Again, here in 2014, we're seeing an outbreak of measles among unimmunized members of a Texas megachurch. I mean, even though that disease, a highly contagious respiratory disease, is prevented by a vaccine that also prevents the mumps and rubella, you know, which is also known as German measles. So... It would appear that in some cases, we now have clergy against inoculation instead of being supportive of it. Yes, yeah, so, well, it's kind of ironic, is it not? Uh, given the advances in science and the knowledge of diseases like smallpox, I'm, I'm very much supportive of inoculations these days. So, back to your running away. Well, yes. Um, well, when my brother was released from jail, he showed himself to be 
an ingrate, and he continued to harass me, even administering a beating from time to time. So I had had enough, and I fled. It said that you took a boat to New York, hoping to find work there as a printer. And when that didn't pan out, you ended up in Philadelphia, where you worked in several printer shops, lodging at the home of John Reed, whose daughter Deborah caught your eye. That is correct. Arrived in Philadelphia in 1723, secured lodging with the Reed family, and worked for a number of printers, though I wasn't satisfied at the immediate prospects. In 1724, I was introduced to the governor of Pennsylvania, Sir William Keith, who, impressed with me, sent me to London, ostensibly to acquire the equipment necessary to start another newspaper in Philadelphia that he, the governor, would back. Yeah, but that didn't work out now, I mean, did it? No, it didn't, and for a number of reasons. Well, first off, before leaving for London, I, well, then 18 years of age, proposed to Deborah Reed, who was then 15 years of age, and, well, due to my impending trip to London and that my financial future was in doubt, her mother did not approve. And then, when I got to London, letters of credit promised by Keith never showed. Yeah. I mean, seems that even back then, politicians made promises they didn't keep. So what happened? Well, I was stuck in London with no credit and no money. Well, finally, I found work as a typesetter in a printer's shop and was able to take full advantage of the city's pleasures, um, attending theater, uh, uh, mingling with the populace in coffee houses, and, and continuing my passion for reading. And while there, you also managed to publish your first pamphlet, a dissertation upon liberty and necessity, pleasure and pain, in 1725. What was that about? Well, in the pamphlet, I argued that an omnipotent, benevolent God is incompatible with notions of human free will and morality, and that Calvinism, the religion into which I was raised as a child, cannot logically be a moral way to live. Well, I mean, that must have gone over like a lead balloon. Excuse me, a, a lead balloon? Never mind. Eventually, though, you did make it back to Philadelphia. Oh, y yes, I did. In 1726, thanks to the health, help of uh, Thomas Denham, a merchant for whom I worked as a clerk, shopkeeper, and a bookkeeper. We're told that you met Denham on the ship that took you to England, and that you and he became close friends. Actually, Thomas was also a, a father figure and a benefactor, and, and not just a friend. And he is featured prominently in my autobiography, where I wrote that I admired his loyalty, embodiment of Quaker sensibilities, and financial thrift, noting that he was an honorable man who had overcome the mistakes of his own past. And in your autobiography, you indicated that your relationship might have continued on had you both not fallen ill with Denham's illness leading to his death in 1728. You received a small legacy from his will, but now, once again, found yourself searching for some sense of belonging. Well, th that is somewhat true. The, the year before his death, though, in 1727, when I was 21 years of age, I, I did create, for want of a better term, a discussion group, the Junto, which was a group of like-minded, aspiring artisans and tradesmen who hoped to improve themselves while they improved their community. So uh, that group did give me a sense of purpose and belonging. It should be noted that the Junto was also known as the Leather Apron Club, and its purpose was to debate questions of morals, politics, and natural philosophy, and to exchange knowledge of business affairs. Yes, it was quite a diverse and wonderful group, and as reading was a great pastime of ours, and with books being expensive and hard to find, we created a library, initially assembled from our own books. But this wasn't sufficient. I mean, was it? No, it wasn't. So I conceived the idea of a subscription library which would pool the funds of the members to buy the books for all to read. Now, this led to the formation of the Library Company of Philadelphia, whose charter I wrote in 1731, and whose first librarian, Louis Timothy, I hired in 1732. Again, it should be noted that books were originally kept in the homes of the first librarians. 
but that in 1739, the collection was moved to the second floor of the State House of Pennsylvania, which is now more commonly known as Independence Hall. Today, the library company has 500,000 or so rare books, pamphlets, and broadsides, more than 160,000 manuscripts, and 75,000 graphic items. Quite the collection. Yes, something of which I am quite proud. As you should be. Meanwhile, back to your story. Thomas Denham has died. Now what? Well, I went back to being a printer. After all, that's what I've always considered myself to be. In 1728, I set up a printing house in partnership with Hugh Meredith, and the following year I became a publisher of the Philadelphia Gazette, a newspaper that allowed me to call for local reforms and initiatives through essays and observations. And we're told that your commentary, plus your cultivation of an image as an industrious and intellectual young man, earned you a great deal of social respect. And that it did. And in 1731, I was initiated into the local Masonic Lodge, becoming Grand Master in 1734. And in that same year, you edited and published the first Masonic book in the Americas, a reprint of James Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons. Yes, and I remained a Freemason for the rest of my life. Speaking of the rest of your life, I mean, let's revisit your lifelong love for Deborah Reed. When we last heard of her, your proposal to marry the then 15-year-old Deborah in 1724 was rejected by her mother, in part because you were about to leave for London. But now, you're back in Philadelphia. Ah, Deborah, the love of my life, and, and while there'd be other women with whom I, um, cavorted, there was always Deborah. Anyhow, when I had to stay in London longer than I had planned, uh, thanks to Governor Keith abandoning me there, Deborah married a man named John Rogers, who, after obtaining her dowry, ran off with it, fleeing to Barbados to avoid debts and prosecution, and in the process, making Deborah unable to formally marry another. Yeah, but that didn't stop the two of you. I mean, did it? <laughs> of course not. On September 1st, 1730, Deborah and I established a common law marriage. Together we had two children, uh, the first a son named Francis Folger Franklin, born in 1732, and the second a daughter named Sarah Franklin, born in 1743. Francis died of smallpox in 1736, and, and Sarah lived to take care of me in my old age. Anyhow, Deborah and I remained together until she died of a stroke in 1774 while I was on an extended mission to England. We're told that she didn't accompany you on any of your trips to Europe. That is correct. She feared the sea, so I traveled alone, which I, I actually favored as it afforded me more of an opportunity to focus on business matters. Um, okay. Uh, we're also told that after you and Deborah first hooked up, that the two of you took in an illegitimate son of yours. Ah, William. Well, yes, we took him in, gave him a home, gave him an education, got him an appointment in 1763 as the royal governor of New Jersey. And what did I get in return? An ingrate. We eventually broke relations over our differences about the American Revolutionary War, for, you see, William was a loyalist who headed up a quasi-military organization that initiated guerrilla forays into New Jersey, southern Connecticut, and New York counties north of the city on behalf of the British. Well, after the war, when the British evacuated New York, William left with them, never to return to America and Good riddance. In the preliminary peace talks in 1782 with Britain, it said that you insisted that loyalists who had borne arms against the United States should not be given any pardon for their acts. Absolutely. Yet, while you had done, so to speak, with William, you developed a relationship with his illegitimate son, your patrilineal grandson, who was also named William but whom you call Temple. Yes, a most wonderful boy. I met him during my second mission to England and, and even arranged for his education. And 
after Deborah passed, I, I gained custody of him and brought him to Philadelphia in 1775. Why, he even served as my secretary on my mission to Paris during the Revolutionary War. Well, now that we've learned about your family, I mean, let's move on to some of your accomplishments. Yes, why don't we? In 1733, you began to publish Poor Richard's Almanac, containing both original and borrowed content. That is true. I published it under the pseudonym Richard Saunders, and although it seemed to be no secret that I was the author, my Richard Saunders character always denied it. Anyhow, Poor Richard's Almanac was a yearly almanac that appeared continually from 1732 to 1758 and was a bestseller for a pamphlet published in the American colonies with print runs reaching 10,000 a year. Yes, the almanacs were quite popular, containing the calendar, weather, poems, sayings, and astronomical and astrological information. You know, information that a typical almanac of the period would contain. We're told that they also included an occasional mathematical exercise, serialized stories to hold the reader's interest year after year, as well as sayings which have stood the test of time with one of the most enduring being, a penny saved is a penny earned. Well, that's somewhat true, uh, but like a long game of telephone, that's not really what I wrote. It's not? Uh, no, it's not. I wrote, a penny saved is a two pence dear, but I guess people didn't like me calling them dear. But I'm bum. Anyhow, in 1741, you began publishing another monthly magazine, called the General Magazine and Historical Chronicle for all the British plantations in America. And in 1758, the year you ceased writing for the Almanac, you printed Father Abraham's Sermon, which is also known as The Way to Wealth. Ah, The Way to Wealth. Uh, basically a collection of adages and advice that had appeared in Poor Richard's Almanac over the years, presented as a speech that some uh, Father Abraham had given to a group of people, which was based on the themes of work ethic and frugality. I mean, can you recall some of those adages? Of course. Um, let's see. There are no gains without pains. Um, one today is worth two tomorrows. And one of my favorites. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And in 1771, you began your autobiography, I mean, which was published after your death. Yes, after all, I was one of my most favorite subjects to write about. Ah, nothing quite like modesty. Well, when you've got it, flaunt it. I guess that applies to taking credit for things that uh, you didn't create. What do you mean? Well, let's take Daylight Saving Time, which is often attributed to a 1784 satire that you anonymously published, though modern Daylight Saving Time was first proposed by a George Vernon Hudson in 1895. Well, who am I to correct a, a misconception that honors me? Still, I am known to be quite a prodigious inventor. That is true. And among your many creations were the lightning rod, the glass harmonica, and not to be confused with the metal mouth instrument, the Franklin stove, bifocal glasses, and of all things, a flexible urinary catheter whose descendants are advertised all over late night and early morning television. However, perhaps what's most amazing, well, at least to me, is that you never patented your invention. Well, that's correct. In my autobiography, I wrote, As we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others, we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others by any invention of ours, and this we should do freely and generously. I am also credited with social innovation, such as paying forward, and I wrote that my scientific works were to be used for increasing efficiency and human improvement. Wow. You know, I must admit that this view seems to fly in the face of your publication, The Way to Wealth. I mean, as there are corporations and companies today who would never, 
ever make any of their inventions or discoveries freely available, looking to make as much as they can off of them. And this includes advances within medicine and health, where many pharmaceutical firms appear to be happy treating diseases rather than curing them. Whatever. You know, the quality and character of many Americans today pales in comparison to the quality and character of Americans in my day. And, well, we weren't even Americans yet. You're also recognized as having a major influence on the then emerging science of demography. That is population studies. And your work, Observations Concerning the Increase of Mankind, drafted in 1851, is said to have influenced economists like Adam Smith, often cited as the father of modern economics, and later, Thomas Malthus. Well, I was also interested in ocean current, electricity, meteorology, traction kiting, cooling, and the effect of temperature on conductivity. Yes. While in England in 1768, you heard the Colonial Board of Customs question why it took British packet ships sailing from Falmouth in Cornwall to New York several weeks longer than it took an average merchant ship sailing from London to Newport, Rhode Island, which was a longer and more complex voyage. Yes, and I was intrigued by the whole situation, wondering why ships that had a shorter and easier trip took a longer amount of time. So I met with a cousin who was a whaler captain out of Nantucket, as well as other experienced ship captains, and learned enough about a strong eastbound mid-ocean current to chart it, naming it the Gulf Stream. I published my Gulf Stream chart in 1770 in England, and they completely ignored it. Well, anyhow, it took many years for British sea captains to adopt my advice on navigating the current, and once they did, they were able to trim two weeks from their sailing time. <sighs> the arrogance of the British in accepting the wind wisdom of someone from the colonies. And there were other currents, well, so to speak, that intrigued you. Well, what was that? Oh, 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 current. Ha ha, very good, yes. I was very much interested in electricity, or electric fluid, as it was then called. Yet I was the first to label vitreous and resinous electricity as positive and negative, and the first to discover the principle of conservation of charge. And for those non-electricians among us, charge conservation is the principle that electric charge can neither be created nor destroyed that the net quantity of electric charge in the universe is always conserved. Yes, in 1747, in a letter to Cadwallader Colden, I wrote, It is now discovered and demonstrated, both here and in Europe, that the electrical fire is a real element, or species of matter, not created by the friction, but collected only. And in 1750, you published a proposal for an experiment to prove that lightning is electricity by flying a kite in a storm that appeared capable of becoming a lightning storm. And on June 15th of 1752, it's thought that you may possibly have conducted your famous kite experiment in Philadelphia, successfully extracting sparks from a cloud. My experiments with electricity led to my invention of the lightning rod, which protected buildings and other structures from lightning. Following experiments on my own house, lightning rods were, were installed on the Academy of Philadelphia, which became the University of Pennsylvania, and the Pennsylvania State House, now known as Independence Hall. And in recognition for your work with electricity, you received the Royal Society's Copley Medal in 1753. And in 1756, you became one of the few 18th century Americans elected as a fellow of the society. Yes, and I even have a unit of electricity named after me. Shocking, no? But dum bum Anyhow, while you've been most noted for using kites with your lightning experiments, you are also associated with using kites to pull humans and ships across waterways. <laughs> yes, in, in some ways, I was the first parasailer. You're also credited for noting a principle of refrigeration, as well as for experiments related to the effect of temperature on electrical conductivity.
And in 1766, oceanographic findings of yours were published, which included ideas for sea anchors, catamaran hulls, watertight compartments, shipboard lightning rods, and even a soup bowl designed to stay stable in stormy weather. Oh yes, I hate it being on a ship during a storm and getting soup all over me, don't you? Yes. I mean, I know I would. I mean, especially if the soup is very hot. I mean, too bad you didn't have an idea for hot coffee in a car. What? Never mind. Anyhow, aside from your experiments related to scientific endeavors, you are also associated with the pro and con list, what is now a common decision-making technique. Yes, when I had to make an important decision on a measure, I, I divided half a sheet of paper by a line into two columns, writing over the one pro and over the other con. Then, during three or four days' consideration, I put down under the different heads short hints of the different motives that at different times occur to me for or against the measure. Now, when I have thus got them all together in one view, I endeavor to estimate their respective weights, and where I find two, one on either side, that seem equal, I strike them both out. If I find a reason pro equal to some two reasons con, I strike out the three. If I judge some two reasons con equal to some three reasons pro, I strike out the five, and thus proceeding, I find at length where the balance lies. And if, after a day or two of farther consideration, nothing new that is of importance occurs on either side, I come to a determination accordingly. Sounds pretty logical. Unfortunately, when it comes to making decisions in Congress today, I mean one group, Republicans and Tea Party members, they only consider what's good for them. And anything that's for the good of the country or of average citizens, well, that doesn't matter. But we'll get into that a little later in our discussion. Well, that's good, because I have more than a few things to get off my chest. Anyhow, before we get into your life as a public servant, a few last matters to cover. You were known to have played the violin, the harp, and the guitar. True. Why, I even composed music, most notably a string quartet in early classical style. And you were an avid chess player and wrote an essay on the morals of chess in December 1766 that was the second known writing about chess in America. Yes, and I was honored by being inducted into the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame in 1999. Well, let's now transition to talking about your public life. In 1736, you created the Union Fire Company, one of the first volunteer firefighting companies in America. And that same year, you printed a new currency for New Jersey based on innovative anti-counterfeiting techniques you had to devise. Yes, uh, throughout my life, I was an advocate for paper money, publishing a modest inquiry into the nature and necessity of a paper currency in uh, 1729. Why, as a printer, I even printed money, and I was influential in the more restrained and thus successful monetary experiments in the middle colonies, which stopped deflation without causing excessive inflation. In 1743, you set forth plans for the Academy, Charity School, and College of Philadelphia which was founded in 1749 and is considered by many to have been the first American Academy. That I did. I was appointed its president in 1749, and it opened for the secondary schooling of boys on August 13th, 1751. It was granted a charter in 1755, and the first class of seven men graduated in 1757 with six Bachelor of Arts degrees and one Master of Arts. In 1765, the first medical school in North America, the Medical School of the College of Philadelphia, was founded, the same year that our first dormitory was built. It should be noted that the college educated many of the future leaders of the United States. Twenty-one members of the Continental Congress were graduates of the school, and nine signers of the Declaration of Independence were either alumni or trustees 
of the university. Yes, I'm very proud to have been involved with the founding of this school, which in 1791 was united with the University of the State of Pennsylvania into, into what is now the University of Pennsylvania. Also in 1743, you founded the American Philosophical Society, an eminent scholarly organization of international reputation that promotes useful knowledge in the sciences and humanities through excellence in scholarly research, professional meetings, publications, library resources, and community outreach. It is considered the first learned society in the United States and has played an important role in American cultural and intellectual life for over 270 years. Ah, the society. I founded it to help men of science discuss discoveries and theories, and it is here that I began my research into electricity, as well as other scientific inquiries that would occupy me for the rest of my life. In 1747, you retired from printing and went into other businesses. I mean, even becoming involved in Philadelphia politics. Yes, I figured it was time. In, in 1748, I was selected as a councilman. In 1749, I became a Justice of the Peace for Philadelphia. And in 1751, I was elected to the Pennsylvania Assembly. And in August of 1753, you were appointed Joint Deputy Postmaster General of North America, where you helped reform the postal system of the time making sure the mail was sent out every week. Yes, and now the once proud U.S. Postal Service is struggling to survive. In 1751, you and a Dr. Thomas Bond obtained the charter from the Pennsylvania legislature to establish the Pennsylvania Hospital, the first medical facility in the American colonies. Ah, Dr. Bond. A wonderful man. Why, during the Revolutionary War, he and his son helped organize the medical department of the Continental Army, establishing the first American field hospitals during the conflict. In 1754, you headed the Pennsylvania delegation to what was known as the Albany Congress. What was the Albany Congress? It was a meeting of representatives sent by the legislatures of seven colonies. Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to discuss better relations with the Indian tribes and common defensive measures against the French threat from Canada in the opening stage of what was to be the French and Indian War. It marked the first time that colonists had met together and it provided a model for later Congresses in prelude to the American Revolution. And, I mean, what was the outcome? of the Albany Congress. Well, we came up with a plan which called for a single executive to be appointed by the King of England who would be responsible for India, Indian relations, military preparedness, and execution of laws regulating various trades and, and financial activities. It also called for a grand council to be selected by the colonial legislatures with the number of delegates to be apportioned according to the taxes paid by each colony. Needless to say, while we delegates passed the plan unanimously, the legislatures of all seven colonies rejected it, as did the British Board of Trade. Still, some of the features of the plan were incorporated into the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution when it was time to form the new U.S. government. Of note, in 1789, you reflected that if the plan coming out of the Albany Congress had been accepted, that it was likely that the revolution might never have occurred when it did. That is true. I said that the colonies, if so united, would have really been sufficient to their own defense and that it would have been unnecessary for there to, to be a British army in the colonies. And in this regard, it would have been unnecessary for there to be acts like the Stamp Act to fund that army acts which were a primary reason for the revolution. But as we now know, that was not to be. In 1756, you organized the Pennsylvania militia to go into battle against Native American uprisings and reportedly was made a colonel, which you declined. Well, I'm a lover, not a fighter. 
also in 1756, you became a member of the Society for the Encouragements of Arts, Manufactures, and Commerce in England, now known as the Royal Society of Arts. And in 1757, I was sent to England by the Pennsylvania Assembly as a colonial agent to protest against the political influence of the Penn family, the proprietors of the colony who used their prerogative to overturn legislation from the elected assembly and who exempted themselves from paying taxes on their land. Interesting. I mean, here it is 2014, and there are wealthy Americans acting like they own the country seeking to overturn laws and programs that they don't like and looking to get away with paying little, if any, taxes. Yes, sometimes the more things change, the more they stay the same. Was that a poor Richard's proverb? No, I cannot take credit for that, although I wouldn't mind people thinking it's mine. It's a French origin used by the French novelist Alphonse Carr. Anyhow, your efforts to oppose the Penn family were unsuccessful. And you returned to Pennsylvania, where you led the anti-proprietary party against the Pens. Yes, but again, my efforts were unsuccessful, though I was elected Speaker of the Pennsylvania House in May of 1764. It seems I miscalculated the fear of average Pennsylvanians that going against the Pens would endanger their political and religious freedoms. And in the October 1764 assembly elections, I lost my seat. Again. I mean, interesting that as in 1764, there are wealthy and powerful people today, when challenged, attempt to leverage the fear in people that they will be punished should the challenge be successful. Again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. French, I know. After losing your assembly seat, you were once again sent to England to continue the struggle against Penn family proprietorship. Yes, but events unfolded that would drastically change the nature of my mission. How so? Well, to pay for British troops stationed in North America after the French and Indian War, the British Parliament imposed a direct tax on the colonies, the stamp tax, requiring that many printed materials in the colonies, like legal documents, magazines, newspapers, and such, be produced on stamped paper produced in London, carrying an embossed revenue stamp. Plus, the stamp tax had to be paid in valid British currency and not in colonial paper money. And I take it you weren't a fan of this act. Oh, hell no. It still, it, it seemed as calc I miscalculated the extent of colonial resistance to the Stamp Act. And when I recommended a friend to the post of stamp distributor for Pennsylvania, many back home thought I supported the act and threatened to destroy my home in Philadelphia. So I felt I needed to do something to correct this misperception and testified before the House of Commons against that act. This coupled with protests in the colonies and even from some British merchants, led to the act being repealed. You're testifying before the House of Commons, and the Stamp Act's subsequent repeal led many to see you as the leading spokesman for American interests in England, and Georgia, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, in addition to Pennsylvania, appointed you as their agent to the Crown. Yes, it was quite an honor. During this time, you traveled about Europe, leveraging your reputation as a philosopher, scientist, and wit to cultivate relationships in England, Germany, France, and elsewhere. Yes, however, my goal was still to represent colonial interests in England. In 1773, you published two of your most celebrated pro-American essays, rules by which a great empire may be reduced to a small one, and an edict by the King of Prussia. That year, you also obtained private letters from the governor and lieutenant governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay that proved they were encouraging the crown to crack down on the rights of Bostonians. That is true, and I sent those letters to America where they helped escalate tensions, leading many in England to view me as the fomenter of serious trouble. Eventually, I left England to return to Philadelphia in March 1775 and gave up any hope I may have had with regard to an accommodationist stance. Well, 
I mean, I'd surely like to think so. I mean, because by the time you arrived in Philadelphia in May 1775, the American Revolution had begun with fighting at Lexington and Concord and with the main British army being trapped in Boston by the New England militia. Yes, the war that was to change history had begun. The Pennsylvania Assembly unanimously chose me as their delegate to the Second Continental Congress, and in June of 1775, I was appointed a member of the Committee of Five that drafted the Declaration of Independence. Yes, I mean the Committee of Five consisted of John Adams of Massachusetts, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, Robert Livingston of New York, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, and yourself from Pennsylvania. The Committee of Five operated from June 11, 1776 until July 5, 1776, the day on which the Declaration was published. I must admit that I was temporarily disabled by gout and unable to attend most meetings of the committee. Still, I, like Adams, Sherman, and Livingston, made important changes to the first draft that Jefferson wrote, and which we incorporated into the final draft that was presented to the Committee of the Whole, which approved the Declaration after making additional changes, including deleting a passage that was critical of the slave trade. So, what you're saying is that the Declaration of Independence, drafted by Jefferson and approved by the Committee of Five, contained a passage that was critical of the slave trade. Yes, but it was critical of British involvement in the slave trade and not necessarily of slavery. Regardless, ever since the Declaration of Independence was first published, there has been controversy over how can a nation proclaiming that all men are created equal also be a nation where slavery is an accepted institution. Yes. I mean, years after it was initially published, the men in the phrase, all men are created equal, has been interpreted by those favoring slavery and by those viewing Caucasians as superior to others as referring to white men and white men only. Why, even today, in 2014, and more than 150 years after the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, far too many Americans embrace white supremacy and racism. The more things change. There you go. Anyhow, the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th, 1776, at which time you supposedly replied to a comment made by John Hancock about the importance of unity. Do you recall what it was? Of course. I said, yes, we must indeed all hang together or most assuredly we shall all hang separately. After the Declaration of Independence was published, you were dispatched to France as Commissioner for the United States in December 1776. True, I took my then 16-year-old grandson, William Temple Franklin, as my secretary, and while there conducted the affairs of my new country toward the French nation, eventually securing a critical military alliance in 1778 that would help win the Revolutionary War for America. And in 1783, you negotiated the Treaty of Paris, which effectively ended the American Revolutionary War. Also true, but I didn't do this alone, and much is also owed to John Jay, a founding father who was first Chief Justice of the United States, Henry Lawrence, who succeeded John Hancock as President of the Congress, and John Adams, founding father, first Vice President of the United States, and its second President. And... I mean, were you happy with the treaty? Most definitely. I do have to admit that I had wanted Britain to cede us the province of Quebec, as I believe their continued presence there would cause conflict in the future. But alas, that was not to be. In 1785, you returned home, second only to George Washington as the champion of American independence. And in special balloting, conducted in October 1785, you were unanimously elected the sixth president of the Supreme Executive Council of Pennsylvania, a position that is analogous to the modern position of governor. Yes, it was quite the honor, and I held that position for slightly over three years. And while governor, you served as delegate to the Philadelphia Convention. I mean, why don't you remind us 
what that was about. Well, the Philadelphia Convention took place from May 25th to September 17, 1787, to address problems in governing the United States of America, which had been operating under the Articles of Confederation. And while the convention was intended to revise those articles, many proponents, chiefly James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, sought to create a new government rather than fix the existing one. And what was your role? Well, I expressed my opinions, which weren't all that well received. Oh? Like what? Well, for one, I believed that executive power was too great to be placed in the hands of one person, and that a committee was a better option. Alexander Hamilton, on the other hand, wanted a single executive appointed for life. In the end, the convention chose a single executive with a limited term. Anything else? Well, yes. For the legislative branch, I favored a unicameral legislature while the majority did not share my beliefs, and a deadlock arose. I helped break that deadlock and helped pave the way for what's now known as the Great Compromise, where larger states would have their way in the lower house of the legislature, where representatives were elected according to population, while the upper house, or senate, would have an equal number of senators from each state. We're also told that an impassioned speech by you, urging delegates to sign the Constitution, led to the document being signed. That is true. I noted that the Constitution was not a perfect document, but that it probably was the best that we could expect. Still, much to my disappointment, of the 55 delegates who attended the convention, only 39 signed the document. Still, that is a majority. And last I looked, America was a country where the majority is supposed to rule. Anyhow, the Constitution has been signed. Now what? Well, I had struggled with... Uh obesity throughout my middle-aged and older years, which resulted in multiple health problems, particularly gout. And after the Constitution was signed, I was rarely seen in public. On April 17, 1790, at the age of 84 years, I died from a pleuritic attack. I, I was interred in Christ Church in Burial Ground in Philadelphia next to my late wife, Deborah. Well, we've just about run out of time, so I'd like to thank you. Benjamin Franklin, Ben, for coming on the show. Still, there are a number of topics I would have liked to have discussed, and I'm hoping that you'll cover them in some parting words for our audience. I mean, you do have parting words, no? Of course I do. How could a writer, printer, and publisher not have words, parting or otherwise? I am considered to be an advocate of republicanism, a political value system that has been a major part of American civic thought since the Revolution. It stresses liberty and unalienable rights as central values, makes the people, as a whole, sovereign, rejects aristocracy and inherited political power, expects citizens to be independent in their performance of civic duties, and vilifies corruption. Now, let me say this again. Republicanism stresses liberty, the quality individuals have to control their own actions. Today's Republican Party, especially those in the Tea and Libertarian Party wings, believe liberty means that people must and ought to behave according to their own free will and take responsibility for their actions. Now, that's all fine and dandy and would be if we weren't now living in a nation of over 300 million people and in a society where one's behavior according to his or her own free will didn't negatively impact the ability of another to behave according to their free will. But unfortunately we do, and I and many of the Founding Fathers knew this from history, that there would be some people seeking to make their liberty, their behavior and actions take precedence over another's. And when it comes to accepting responsibility for their actions, ha! I didn't see any Republicans taking responsibility for shutting down the government this past October, did you? A government, I might add, that I helped create. Oh yes, well so much for accepting responsibility, though that is what they advocate. Anyhow, I digress. The liberty which I and other founding fathers had related to life under a social contract, 
namely that individuals have consented, either explicitly or tacitly, to surrender some of their freedoms and submit to the authority of a ruler or magistrate, or to the decision of the majority, in exchange for protection of their remaining rights. Antecedents of social contract theory are found in antiquity, in Greek and Stoic philosophy, in Roman and canon law, as well as in the Old Testament, with the biblical idea of the covenant. Among those who theorized on social contract and natural rights were Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Immanuel Kant, and Locke's concept of the social contract that natural rights were inalienable was invoked in our Declaration of Independence. So, back to the notion of liberty. I and other founding fathers embraced a social liberal concept of liberty, a positive liberty, which placed an emphasis upon social structure and agency and is therefore directed toward ensuring egalitarianism, which favors equality for all people. Egalitarianism is both a political doctrine that all people should be treated as equals and have the same political, economic, social, and civil rights, and a social philosophy advocating the removal of economic inequalities among people or the decentralization of power. Now, this is the basis for the Declaration of Independence, which I helped craft, though it was primarily Thomas Jefferson who wrote it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Today, as I and other founding fathers look at the nation we helped found over 200 years ago, we are truly dismayed as those most advocating republicanism, the Republican Party, have distorted and subverted that very political value system. Importantly, rather than stressing liberty for all, they seem to only care about their own rights rather than making the people as a whole sovereign and rejecting aristocracy, they care only for America's new aristocracy, the predatory and greedy top 2% of the nation. And rather than vilify corruption, they seek to break, bend, and repeal every regulation, rule, and law they can, which present, protects the common good and limits the wealth that they and their wealthy lords can steal from the general public. Yes, I know about the argument that the Declaration states all men are created equal and that we didn't outlaw slavery. The reality is, is that while some of us did want to outlaw slavery at the time, others didn't, and we needed to be united in declaring our independence in order to become the United States. So we compromised and let slavery stand, placing the independence of the nation from England ahead of the independence of some individuals. Compromise, yet another concept which today's Republican and Tea Party politicians and their supporters have rejected. Yes, I and the other founding fathers are truly dismayed at the antics of those in the Republican Party who by their acts and words discredit the concept of republicanism and sometimes I get so angry that I'd love to attach a lightning rod to the lot of them during a lightning storm. <laughs> Just saying. Words of wisdom from Benjamin Franklin, America's first Renaissance man, and credited with being the most influential of the founding fathers in inventing the type of society America would become. A marriage of the practical values of thrift, hard work, education, community spirit, self-governing institutions, and opposition to authoritarianism, both political and religious, with the scientific and tolerant values of the Enlightenment. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm with Ben and share his dismay and anger at those in this country who hide behind the liberties that he and other founding fathers provided us, while seeking to deprive and subvert those very same liberties for others. So until our next chatting with history, 
This is Dan Gersten reminding all of you, I mean, don't fly a kite in a lightning storm. Well, unless you're a Republican or Tea Party. Thank you for watching. Talk to me. Talk to me.